Welcome to this video lecture which begins a new topic which has to do with the moment of inertia um, which is the subject of chapter 9 in the textbook. So today I will focus in on the content from section 9.1 um, in this chapter. So I'll begin with an introduction to the moment of inertia, uh, why it is important to be able to calculate it and then show you uh, through a formal definition of the moment of inertia uh, which is also the second moment uh, how to do calculations for some simple shapes in two dimensions so let's begin with uh, you know what it means to uh, say that we want to calculate the moment of inertia so remember in uh, in previous lectures we have developed an understanding of uh, calculating moments right especially the first moment uh, back in chapter 7 we calculated the centroid um, by using first moment uh, which is focused on calculating essentially the center of gravity uh, then we went on to encounter this situation where we apply load to a beam and then we uh, developed a formal process to be able to calculate for example the load uh, and how it affects the, sh uh, the stress the shear stress or the shear force and the bending moment as a function of length along the beam and then we ended up creating bending moment diagrams such as this so if you think about uh, the moment and the bending moment diagram right here what it is telling us is how the beam uh, is uh, subjected to moments that are causing it to bend or twist right? so um, uh, to remind you, our formal definition of the first moment of inertia was basically the quantity qy or qx where we are finding the moment about the y-axis by taking the integral of the distance of the point from the x-axis uh, multiplied by an area element in 2D or a volume element in 3D. Right? So this was our first moment. Uh, so here we are going to extend this idea because now we want to also understand how to effectively describe the bending process of a beam uh, in the context of uh, the bending moment right? and in other words we want to find out where the centroid of the moment is uh, that is tending to bend the beam or rotate an object and that's really what is at the heart of uh, the second moment of inertia calculation okay? so Let's begin with the formal definition of the moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia is essentially the moment of the moment. Right? So remember the moment was x times dA right? in the context of an area element uh, or x times dV in the context of a volume element. Uh, um, and of course if you multiply um, the area of volume element by an appropriate specific density you also are talking about the moment due to the mass right so now if I take this moment and I multiply it again by x then I have x times x dA which is the moment of the moment or in other words it's the second moment of the area so the formal definition here is that you know the moment about second moment or the moment of inertia about the y-axis is integral of x squared dA or x squared dV likewise the the moment about the x-axis is going to be integral of y squared dA in 2D or y squared dV in 3D. Right? So the point of this calculation is that it determines uh, effectively where the point of application of all the moments are. Right? And um, the reason we want to do this is that there are many situations in which the forces that are being applied are essentially in the form of pure couples right and that lead effectively to a pure bending uh, rotation effect so as an example think of this beam here it's called an eye beam because of its eye shape so you can see that's eye shaped right and um, this eye beam is being subjected to um, a force such that effectively it's only undergoing uh, it's it's on, it only has a couple so you can think of uh, a couple being formed by you know um, by this pair of forces here 
and another couple being formed by this pair of forces here while this one here is acting along the line of symmetry but there is no uh, there is no moment right? so in this case what's happening is that either there's a pure bending or a combination of bending and twisting of this I beam another excellent example is to consider what happens to a body which is placed under a fluid such as water now um, <clears throat> You know, when you think about dams uh, or other uh, uh, other constructions in which uh, which controls the flow of water uh, in a lake or in a river, oftentimes under the water there is a gate that is opened or closed to let the water in and out, right? To control the flow of water. So this this gate, you think of this a little circle here as being a gate. This gate is now being subjected to forces due to the fact that it is underwater. It turns out that from the, the laws of fluids, the force that is acting on the gate uh, across an elemental area delta A is given by the pressure at that position times delta A. Now the interesting thing is that when you're under a fluid, the pressure at any given point is proportional to the height uh, of the fluid under the surface. So for example, in this case, Y is the height of this element delta A below the surface given by this position here and that pressure is given by gamma times H. A gamma is the specific weight which is um, also the product of density times the acceleration due to gravity. So in other words P is uh, rho G H. This is a familiar form where rho is the mass density and uh, G is acceleration due to gravity right and H is the height below the surface. So, so there is this uh, uh, local um, pressure related force, hydrostatic pressure related force that's acting on the body. And um, part of this is that <clears throat> if you think about the body now, it's being subjected to, so let me just, you know, show this circular gate here. And let's say this is my surface. And um, at every given position along this um, along this uh, gate now I have force acting that's dependent on the height so h1 h2 h3 and since the heights are different you can see that the force acting here is going to be smaller than the force acting at the deeper depth so now you can see that as you go along this uh, remember this force is a pressure force so when I look at the cross section of this gate it's this identical force acting on both sides right except now the magnitude is changing as you go uh, deeper and deeper in. So so there is no linear motion here in some sense because the force is a hydrostatic pressure force but there's clearly uh, a bending going on here because the force down below uh, is, is much larger than the effective force up there. Right? So, so that's why this is being subjected to something like a pure bending process. <coughs> So the, let's let's f stop for a moment and kind of uh, just let this sink in because understanding the physical meaning of the moment of inertia is is important in many different uh, aspects of engineering. So again, so if I think about the moment of inertia of a plane area about a given axis, what it is measuring is how difficult it is to change uh, to 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 bend it or change its angular motion about the axis. So that means to rotate it about the axis. So in other way, it's also telling us how resistant the object is to bending or twisting um, about a given axis. Right. So the larger the moment of inertia, the more difficult is it to bend that object or to rotate that object about a given point. Um, you know, think about uh, you know how you would um, uh, tie a, uh, a stone to a string and try to rotate it around you know around an axis you'll find that uh, the larger the stone, the harder it is to rotate around an axis, right? So that's kind of a, a very simple way to think about the moment of inertia. Now, uh, the moment of inertia calculation, if you uh, think about it, it, we are thinking in terms of area or volume, and that is very easily converted into a mass by multiplying by the appropriate aerial density or the volume density of the object. And, and what it is telling is us that in, in some ways it's telling us how far uh, each part of the object is from a given axis right? in terms of its mass or volume. So the larger it is, la uh, the further away it is from the axis, the larger is its moment of inertia. 
okay so for example let's say this is my axis here and uh, you know I have an object rotated located here uh, which has a moment of inertia about this axis let's call it I1 versus the same object here which is located you know much closer to the axis so I2 here is going to be much less than I1 okay so it's going to require much less force to rotate this object around this uh, uh, around the center here as compared to this one out here that, so that's in a in, in a sense another way to think about uh, the moment of inertia. Okay, so now let's uh, you know think about how to do the calculation for the moment of inertia, especially for the two D case, right? So again, we'll go back to this example of a body submerged within the fluid, so that you uh, get some more confidence working with such such problems, right? So as I said, at, at the depth uh, h below the fluid or y below the fluid, the total force acting on an area element is going to be given by gamma times um, um, y, which is the height below the fluid, times delta a, which is the area of the fluid. Right. So, so that's that's what this is. And uh, remember, we are at a height of uh, y below the fluid. Okay. So, the moment now. Can be calculated about the y-axis so the y-axis is right here so we're trying to think about you know what is the tendency for this object um, which is being uh, subjected to the hydrostatic pressure and the uh, and the resulting forces to uh, to rotate about the x-axis or to bend about the x-axis uh, in this case it's a standalone object inside so we're thinking about you know how much force it would require to rotate it about the y-axis and that is related to the moment of inertia so remember the moment of inertia is y times the first moment so the first moment is y dA and so we have mx is y squared dA and then we integrate and we find the moment of inertia ix this is the symbol that is typically used to de determine uh, to, to indicate that you're talking about the moment of inertia which is i subscript x which means it's the moment of inertia about x axis and that is the integral of y squared dA so this is our basic definition of the moment of inertia. Okay, so let's uh, let's apply that idea to an example problem here, and uh, we want to calculate the moment of inertia of this triangle with respect to its base, which is uh, parallel to the x-axis. So, in other words, what we want to do is we want to calculate uh, ix, which is the integral of y squared dA. So, uh, as you probably um, notice from your exercises in chapter 5 when we encountered a complex shape um, we try, tended to solve the first moment of inertia calculations by uh, breaking up the object into uh, strips that in the uh, in the limit tend to have uh, infinitesimally small widths and so we can approximate each strip as a rectangle and that's what we're going to do here right so uh, so this is this uh, this was called the Riemann approach so the Riemann approach is to break an object into strips and decrease the length of the strip uh, and so in in the limit the strip becomes a rectangle and you can then add up uh, the areas of the strips to get the total area of the object right so in this case uh, if I start with strip dy it's located at height y and so the moment of this uh, particular strip uh, around the x-axis is nothing but the height y square times the uh, area of the strip dA, right? And now dA in turn, in turn is is going to be uh, the width of the strip given by the distance here, so L times the thickness of the strip, which is dy, L dy. Okay, so that's our first uh, thing here. So we have uh, di x is um, y square times l times dy okay so now we want to basically end up finding a convenient function that describes our integral here so what remains to be done now in order to be in, to be able to find i x which is the integral of y square l dy i want to make sure that remember now we have to integrate from the base which is at y equals zero all the way to this position here where y equals h right so this is our limits of the integral h. so now only thing that remains is to realize that as I move along the triangle 
my base length L is varying. It varies from uh, B at Y equals 0 all the way to 0 at H equals Y. So that means it's varying as a function of L and so I need to find out how L is related to, to Y. And in this particular example we can use the property of similar triangles to relate L to Y. So if I look at the value of L divided by the value of B in this case due to the similar triangles this is going to be nothing but um, uh, related to the fact that um, L is is basically a part of this top triangle here so let me just mark it out while B is a part of this entire triangle here so those are two similar triangles and so L over B uh, in this case L over B is going to be that height there h minus y divided by the total height uh, which is h right? and so if I rearrange this I get L equals um, b over h into h minus y so that gives me the function of and the, the value of L as a function of y right so this is something so now I can go back and put it into my uh, integral here so dix from integral 0 to h is going to be ix and this is nothing but now integral of uh, b times y square times um, uh, h minus y over h times dy okay uh, and so if i rearrange this you can see that b over h is a constant so i'm going to just uh, do that and then i'm going to expand this product here so i have h y square minus y cube dy from 0 to h and so if you perform this integral now you'll find that you should get uh, you should basically end up getting this value here okay uh, basically ix equals 1 over 12 bh uh, bh to the power 3 okay so please go ahead and do that so you know start with this and then show that uh, you get uh, the moment of inertia of the triangle about the x-axis is 1 by 12 bh cube so take a moment and uh, and you know let this sink in. So the first thing you should note is what are the dimensions of the moment of inertia. You can see that it is uh, distance meter to the power four um, meter to the power four units. So that means you know um, it's uh, it's it's a unit that we normally don't encounter. So when you see something that is expressed in meters per four, one possibility is that it is the moment of inertia. Okay, so let's generalize this idea to arbitrary 2D shapes now, uh, you know, so that we have uh, a starting point for working through moment of inertia calculations for any, any type of 2D shape. So here is my 2D shape um, and I want to calculate moment of inertia either about the x-axis or about the y-axis shown here and I have area element dA is given by dx dy. So the way we are going to attack many of these problems is by the slicing technique, the Riemann approach. And um, so we can either think about calculating the moment of inertia about the x-axis. So, so this is ix, it's going to be y square uh, dA. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take a slice that is parallel to the x-axis so that we can write dA. In this case, dA becomes, you know, um, uh, some distance LX times DY right uh, so that's what we're going to do and then we're going to LX LX you express it as a function of Y and once you do that uh, you're good to go similarly here we're going to do IY equals X squared DA and now we want to express uh, DA as a function of uh, a variation in X so it's going to be LY DX and then ly is going to be expressed as a function of x okay again using the the strip technique okay. so in the end what you're going to be able to do is you're going to calculate ix as integral of y squared da and iy is equal to integral of x squared da so that's basically the general approach right okay so let me end with two examples uh, of some uh, rather two definitions that are going to become useful the first thing is the moment of inertia 
calculation in polar coordinates. So remember, polar coordinates is uh, is r and theta, right? And r and theta are related to x and y. So the fact that r equals under root of x square plus y square, and uh, theta is equal to tan inverse of y over x. Okay, so that's how you transform between polar and uh, rectangular coordinates. Now, oftentimes you have shapes like cylinders and spheres and circles that are easier to work with in rectangular coordinates because the only thing that might be changing, for example, is theta. Right? So think about an area element here at a position r at some angle theta. Uh, so its x coordinate and y coordinate are shown here, and we want to calculate its uh, moment of inertia. <coughs> Well, in polar coordinates, the moment of inertia is defined as follows. It's the integral of r squared dA, right? And depending on how you can express dA, you may have to do a double integral or a single integral, okay? Um, so, so that's something that, uh, that we will work on uh, with examples later on. But now, remember, I just said that r squared is nothing but x squared plus y squared. So if I now go back and express this expression, I have basically x squared plus y squared dA, which is now integral of x squared dA plus integral of y squared dA, which is nothing but iy plus ix. Right? And so you can see that essentially um, your uh, polar coordinates can be simplified to uh, the calculation of a moment of inertia in rectangular coordinates are called rectangular calculations. That's what these two are. And so sometimes this transformation is going to become very useful. Okay? And that is that your polar moment can be expressed as sum of the rectangular moments. So please make sure to, um, you know, uh, uh, remember this concept here, rectangular moment versus the polar moment. Okay, so let's end today's discussion with uh, something that's called the radius of gyration. Okay. So remember that we have been thinking about the moment of inertia as as the point in the body where uh, you know the moment of moments uh, are acting, right? So that helps you understand how how a body can bend or how it can rotate about a fixed center of uh, about some axis. So here we're going to extend that idea to thinking about the fact that, you know, let's say that you have um, a, a, a body and you want to find out at what position I can put all the mass of the body and still achieve the same moment of inertia, right? So this helps you conceptualize, you know, how easy or how hard it is to rotate an object about a, a fixed axis. So that means I uh, let's say that I want to find uh, the question to uh, uh, the answer to the question that uh, I have an automobile or I have an aeroplane. And now, effectively determine where the object's mass is located in the context of making a turn about a bend, about a curve, or you know a, a, a fighter plane trying to turn in a short radius, right? So, so let's say I want to find out how it rotates about this axis oh and instead of having this object can I replace it with basically one mass uh, that tells me exactly how this rotation is going to take place so yeah the answer is this yes it can be done and the way you do it is that you basically think about um, uh, an object like this that has uh, this object a that has some you know diffuse shape and total mass and replace it with a strip that's located as a, at a specific distance from the x-axis so let's say we want to calculate um, how it um, uh, we want to calculate its ix so its moment about uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the x-axis which is shown here or the y-axis which is shown here right and um, so so we can do that by saying, okay, let's replace it with a strip of the same weight at a distance that is either kx uh, away from the x-axis or ky away from the y-axis. Okay. So what that means is that what we are saying is that ix, which is originally integral of y square dA, 
I am going to now take that object and keep it at a distance of uh, ky and and find out um, uh, what uh, its moment of inertia is and if I can equate this ky square a with my uh, my the moment of inertia calculation of the object then I have found an equivalent position called ky which is the distance ky um, from the y-axis uh, or a distance equivalently you can say um, iy is equal to integral x square da which is kx square a um, sorry I think I've uh, I'm using the wrong terms here so let's just this is kx square to be consistent with ix and iy okay uh, please make that note so this is ix uh, and this should be um, let's see kx square so let's make sure so ky here is uh, is this one here okay this ky and iy are consistent so so the moment of inertia about the y-axis remember is the distance um, measured um, in the x dimension which is right here uh, while the moment of inertia about the x axis uh, is this case here the dimension uh, the distance is measured along the y so that's y square and kx is, uh, is for the x axis moment and ky is for the y axis so if I do this uh, analysis where I replace the entire object with a strip of the same mass or area or volume at the specific distances either ky uh, as shown here or kx as shown here then it turns out that I can rewrite the individual values ky as being integral of uh, uh, iy over a and kx is integral of ix over a okay so let's see if you got it right it seems like I might have uh, missed some notations here because my notations out here are saying kx is equal to square root of ly uh, I, iy over a so let's go back to this side. so what I have in the figure here is ky and this is measuring rotation about the y-axis so so these are typos here so so this is what we should be looking at okay and um, I will double check and make sure that we have the correct uh, notations in in the slides that I upload but uh, the point here is that we are finding a radius or a location about each axis such that that radius is going to be given by the moment of inertia divided by the area and the square root okay and so these radii are known as the radii of gyration so in a way it tells you you know where the mass the area or the volume of my object is concentrated um, in the form of a strip so that when I rotate it about a given axis by using these particular uh, distances or radii it gives me the same moment of inertia of the object about an axis O okay so that's the point here and by the way the the polar uh, radius of gyration is square root of uh, uh, IO so KO is going to be square root of JO by A which is where J is the moment of inertia in polar coordinates yeah. okay um, you know uh, if you have as a kid tried to spin a top then uh, you have uh, encountered the idea of the radius of gyration so remember uh, if, you, if you think about a top you know typically it's a you know it's it's somewhat like a cone right you know that the top when it's stationary uh, it does not spin uh, it does not stay stable so now you know you give it a uh, rotation so it's rotating about some axis and then you can let it uh, put it on the ground and it starts uh, you know it remains stable for some time but you might have noticed that initially when you put it it oscillates with a certain angle so that means you know it spins but it's not completely vertical so it might go from this state to a state where it is you know at some angle like that right so initially it's oscillating between these two and um, and that oscillation is a tendency uh, is due to the fact that gravity is trying to pull it down 
but the moment of inertia uh, helps it uh, basically remain stable because it's hard for gravity to pull it down uh, uh, because it has to overcome the moment of inertia right? and that is coming uh, is being assisted by the fact that it has energy from angular motion due to the spin you gave it so the radius of gyration tells you in some sense you know how far this object can uh, bend away from the vertical axis before it actually tilts over or in other words it remains stable so that uh, is is one example of where the radius of gyration uh, uh, has been experienced by you yeah. okay so so um, important engineering objects that involve bending for example a bridge so if I have you know two supports and I span a bridge across it right and I load it we know that it's it's going to try to bend like that right so so that's where uh, that's one example of where uh, bending moment becomes very important similarly if I have a, a structural beam that is you know holding up some weight here um, uh, that weight you know is acting down and um, any kind of small force that acts on this direction is going to want to you know basically uh, bend the structure or buckle it and that's again a place where bending moment becomes very important okay. so the moment of inertia tells us how easy or difficult it is to bend or twist the structure and uh, you know think about any um, any object that involves motion with uh, with rotation and you find that uh, bending moment uh, might become useful or will become useful rather in uh, in explaining how um, uh, how easy or how difficult it is to uh, to bend uh, either bend the object or make it rotate about uh, a possible axis. Okay. Um, so hopefully uh, we are going to continue with section nine point two in the next class, and that will include some example problems. Um, but Thank you for listening to this part one, section 9.1 of today's lecture. Uh, just as a as a uh, update, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so this is a typo here. So ky should be uh, the moment of inertia along the y-axis divided by a, and kx should be the moment of inertia along the x-axis divided by a. Okay, so please do make the corrections, and I will update my slides as well. With it. Thank you very much. Bye bye.